The Dalai Lama fled to Dharamsala in northern India in 1959 after China invaded Tibet. Today, it's home to nearly 30,000 Tibetan refugees. The world thinks of them as a patient people who preach compassion and non-violence. But there is a deep unease brewing here. The Exile Brothers are the most popular Tibetan band among Dharamsala's youth. Jigmi sings about a country he's never seen and a fight for independence he's determined never to give up. But these young Tibetans are at odds with the man they worship. Today, the Tibetan government in exile, led by the Dalai Lama, pursues autonomy for Tibet rather than independence. It's a policy known as the middle path. <laughs> Dharam Sala's Buddhist faithful are making their way to the Dalai Lama's temple. It's a daily ritual for these elderly Tibetans. But there's something about this morning's prayers that attracts a younger crowd. They're here because today is Martyr's Day, when Tibetans honour those who've died in the fight for independence. <laughs> In 1998, Thupten Nudup, a local Dharamsala monk, despaired at the lack of progress towards independence. He took part in a hunger strike in Delhi, and when the authorities tried to break it up, he set himself alight. The Dalai Lama came to the hospital just before he died. <laughs> Nudup received a hero's funeral and his sacrifice inspired young Tibetans not willing to wait until the next life for freedom. This is radical rhetoric for a people famous for non-violence. Tenzin Sundu is at the forefront of the independence movement. He believes the middle path is a sellout. So we are today trying to fit inside the legal framework of People's Republic of China and uh, this would actually mean that we have compromised on everything. Tomorrow there will be no Tibetan national flag, there will be no Tibetan uh, national anthem, no Tibetan currency, no foreign policy. I think that is the only possible way open to us. In the current world, the nation-state theory has become 
almost uh, irrelevant and the people are looking for more cooperative way for example the european union they are now gradually forgetting their own uh, sovereignty and uh, uh, trying to come more and more together the symbol of our struggle Tenzin Sundu grew up in India, the son of Tibetan refugees. He's devoted his life to the cause. Yeah, I show you my photographs of Tibet. In 1997, Sundu took the extraordinary step of sneaking into Tibet. He was desperate to see his homeland. And I was in a prison quite close to here. Sundu was arrested and spent three months in a Chinese prison, where he says he was tortured. Uh, arriving in India, I met His Holiness. Uh, he was uh, deeply touched that uh, somebody who was born in exile uh, took the risk to go to Tibet. While inside, Sundu met a political prisoner, a man who was jailed for putting up pro-independence posters. Today he's still there. 18 years of imprisonment. Although I'm, I'm trying to work hard, thinking of him, you know, sometimes I feel that I'm not doing enough. You know, whatever I'm doing, I feel I'm not doing enough. In 2002, when the Chinese Premier was in Mumbai, Sundu unfurled a free Tibet banner right outside his hotel window. And then when Premier Wen Jiaobao visited Bangalore last April, Sundu again evaded security. This is the nerve centre of students for a free Tibet. If you can direct them to places where they are need most useful. It's a shoestring operation, most are volunteers. So this is um, Seattle, outside the hotel where Hu Jintao is arriving. Larun Tethong is a Tibetan who grew up in Canada. She organized protests against the Chinese president when he was in America three months ago. Isn't that great? Wait. So this is Washington, D.C. This is in Lafayette Park. This was on the cover of USA Today, this picture. Mm -hmm. so By protesting, these young Tibetans are defying a request from the Dalai Lama. <laughs> The most conducive atmosphere for dialogue with thugs like them is one where there's global protests and uproar and the pressure is on and it costs them something and they have no choice but to engage in dialogue. That's a conducive atmosphere for dialogue with these guys. And, and what we're trying to create or what our leadership is trying genuinely to create is actually, I believe, just a, it's a flawed approach. The premise is all wrong. It sounds like you're more concerned about upsetting China than highlighting their human rights abuses in Tibet. What is the use of upsetting the Chinese people? What you will get out of it? Whatever we do, we must get some result. Without any result or the negative result, then why you, you should do it? Only to satisfy your ego, that is silly, that is, that is just a um, uh, stupid thing. It is for our freedom. And, this, and for us, it's not just uh, that we are doing, but it's our duty to do that in free country. Then otherwise, what are you here for in exile? Go back. understand why some Tibetans, particularly the younger generation, why they're very frustrated with the middle path policy? I don't think they are frustrated. There may be few people are frustrated and I never come across uh, a large number of Tibetan younger generation are frustrated with that. Like, oh, we're fine here suffering in exile and 
you know, we Chinese are our brothers and sisters and we don't hate them and we love them and it's all going to be okay in world peace. No. Be honest. I'm fed up. Ladon and Sundu are training a new group of leaders to run their campaigns. We want to make Chinese people, especially overseas Chinese, we want to make them feel socially stigmatized by Tibet. We want them to feel badly every time they leave their home and go out in the public and the rest of the world because people are looking at them saying, your occupation of Tibet, you know, Tibet is a black mark on your face. <laughs> These young activists have taken a big step by opposing the Dalai Lama's policy. His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the reincarnation of Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of love and compassion. And because he's the Buddha who knows the past, present and the future, nobody can and nobody will ever question him. Are people scared to speak out against the middle path because they don't want to be accused of being against the Dalai Lama? Yeah, absolutely, I think so. And I, I mean, I, I depend so fiercely respect and follow the word of His Holiness and at the same time are, are, have a, you know, incredible, wonderful, somewhat warrior-like history. Most of the world has forgotten this history, but these young activists turn to it for inspiration. So what's he saying? He's saying that, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, if you want real, if you want independence, it is we have to take it, and nobody, nobody would ever give it to us. They've produced this video to honor these Tibetan fighters who battled the Chinese army for nearly 25 years. The Kampa warriors, as they were known, were funded by the CIA, but they lost their US backing shortly after President Richard Nixon visited China in 1973. If every Tibetan could be like these persons, I mean, the freedom fighters, then it won't take much to free Tibet. La Sang Sering is a former camper warrior who owns a small bookshop in Dharamsala. He advises Sundu and his friends. La Sang was one of the first generation of Tibetans to be born in exile. After leaving high school, he spent two years fighting the Chinese. Why don't people know about the armed resistance? Why is it missing from, from a lot of popular knowledge about Tibet? Playing up to the international uh, image about Tibetans being uh, peaceful and uh, non-violent, and to that extent, then there is the need to downplay the role of the armed resistance. And uh, somehow I'm not happy with this situation. Faced with growing international pressure, in 1974, the Dalai Lama called on the Kampa warriors to lay down their arms. La Sang had tried to persuade the Dalai Lama not to get involved. I felt betrayed. I still feel betrayed. The Tibetan leadership has preached non-violence ever since. He said, when all Tibetans learn to generate compassion for the Chinese, then we will become more powerful and the Chinese will come to talk to us. I mean, come on. In my view, this is not even worthy of a bedtime story for nursery kids. The Tibetan government in exile believes it has a mandate for the middle path, because of a referendum held in 1997. However, only 2,200 people inside Tibet were surveyed. Sundu and his friends are convinced the other 6 million Tibetans would not choose to remain part of China. He tells me about an old woman in Tibet who's often interviewed on underground radio. 
and um, these radio people they ask her some cheeky questions but uh, your holiness is asking for uh, genuine autonomy and now you are seeing independence do you not see a contradiction she says i respect the dalai lama but <laughs> the refugee reception center is full of people who've recently fled tibet Sundu's friend Sering looks after the nearly 3,000 who come here each year. Uh, like they got like scapes. I must say, it's bitten by the what they call um, insects on the way to here, like you know, bugs. Hundreds of Tibetan children are sent to India by their parents. <laughs> It's a sign of what life must be like inside Tibet. When parents send their children on a dangerous trek through the Himalayas, rather than have them grow up under Chinese occupation. This little boy shows me a drawing of his long journey through the mountains. The Chinese forbid Tibetans from owning photos of the Dalai Lama. I want to know if they believe in following the middle path. Mm -hmm. They tell me that people inside Tibet don't really understand or even know about the Dalai Lama's shift in policy. If the majority of people inside Tibet support the middle path, why are there still people who are risking their lives um, to call for independence? I don't know. Anyone has called for independence and risked their life. There are so many uh, demonstrations and uh, so many people uh, ended up uh, in the jail. But uh, no one can clarify that their demand was independence. This is a huge claim for the Prime Minister to make. As president of the ex-political prisoners association, monk Na Wong Weber doesn't appreciate the attempt to rewrite history. Na Wong keeps track of the number of Tibetan political prisoners currently inside Chinese jails. He tells me he has proof of recent pro-independence activities. In January this year, a man was arrested in the Tibetan capital Lhasa for putting up free Tibet posters. Pro-independence is an emotional thing and politics is a reality of life. You cannot live in dream. You shall have to uh, uh, give the results. I always give the example of a little girl about to be raped, crying for help. What do you do? Look out your window, find it is the local mafia boss with all his goons. Then you become realistic. 
You become practical, close your curtains, turn on your music and look the other way. This is what people tell me when they tell me to be realistic in the face of Chinese might. And as I see it, opposing wrong is not just a question of winning and losing, it is a moral duty. Meanwhile, Tibetans are being rapidly outnumbered by Chinese immigrants. The opening of the new railway last week, which links Beijing to Lhasa, will only worsen the situation. Soon there will be so many Chinese in Tibet, it will become meaningless to hope for a Tibet for Tibetans. Do you trust China? Yes. Why? After all that they've done and what they continue to do? They are uh, human beings. We are human beings. The human beings shall have to uh, trust with each other. Otherwise, this uh, humanity cannot survive. Unless the China proves they are not trustworthy, until that we shall have to trust them. Don't you think they've proven that with everything that they've done to your people? They have proved in the past and uh, in this moment, for the last four and a half years, we are in a dialogue and uh, they have not uh, proved as yet. And I think they are going out of their way to appease. They have been listening to China and, and bringing Chinese demand on the Tibetan people. But it doesn't seem to be working. The Chinese don't even appear to take the middle path seriously. We cannot see, you know, uh, major change from his position. And that is why there are little, there is little progress within this discussion. But he says it should remain part of China. No, if he can say these words and uh, he can stop all the activities, you know, against China, we are, we are ready. But the Dalai Lama is powerless to stop these angry young Tibetans. A few weeks after I visited the Chinese embassy in Delhi, Tibetan university students overran it in protest against the new railway. Lhasang is calling on the younger generation to take their battle inside Tibet. What we want! We want freedom! What we want! We want freedom! I'm calling upon Tibetans to go into China to sabotage their economic infrastructure, but I cannot go into details. This is what I call the strategy of the mosquito, to hurt China's economic infrastructure inside China. The aim will not be to take life, but we will be realistic enough to understand that it is not in our power and in our control to decide, uh, to control the consequences of our every action. If we are about to blow up a bridge and a truck comes uh, along the way, that is not in our hands to decide. While I've been in Dharamsala, the Dalai Lama has been in South America giving talks on peace and religion. Today, everyone has come out to welcome him home. Today, many people ask, no, has the middle way policy divided the Tibetan people? What I'm saying is it has divided every individual Tibetan between their love and loyalty to His Holiness and also their need and desire for freedom. Are you worried about what might happen when the Dalai Lama is no longer here to unite the Tibetan people. I do not worry for anything because a Buddhist monk do not worry for anything. But the Tibetan people certainly have something to worry about. This flag represents the homeland they still long for and the younger generation is going to make sure the Dalai Lama doesn't... Today it's to refugee. Today it's to refugee.